We are going to be doing an overview of our pneumatic grabber and the mechanism we have to grab both the cones and the cubes. So this year one of our goals was to actually figure out a way to pick up these kind of awkwardly shaped cones in such a way that you'll be able to grab them from any angle almost as well as being able to write them because when you set them on the peg in the grid they need to be upright. They aren't going to sit upside down or on their sides. So in order to achieve that on our grabber here, we actually do have a mechanism that allows it to rotate the cone based on gravity when you pick it up. So when you clamp down, you'll be able to see that we grab it and then as you lift it off the ground, the cone actually rotates upright to allow us to set it on the grid pegs more effectively. The problem came with this design when we also wanted to be able to lift up the cubes. If I can grab one of those. These cubes pose an issue because this gap between our compliant wheels here are too narrow to grab one of these cubes effectively. Like you're never going to get that in there easily. So what instead we do with the cube is we actually come from the top and grab down and there's actually chopped up pneumatic wheels that we used in previous years that are going to grab the cube and allow us to pick it up and it's not going to come out of there and when we're done you just drop it and it falls right out. This design, because we do have that floor pickup and the any angle cone pickup, does allow us to pick up the cones from the lower part of the grid. So say if you have a low lot that just drops the cone at an angle, we can come in, manipulate this in such a way that we can upright it and then go set it up on the higher pegs for additional scoring. Um, the same does apply when we use the cubes here. Moving up to the claw. So the claw is driven by two of these Bimba uh, three-inch stroke half-inch bore uh, pneumatic cylinders so that we can clamp down onto our game piece. We have this piece of three-eighths inch tubing uh, through here um, to give us rigidity. Um, we'd like this to be a bit better. Ideally, we would have had a shaft coming off the back of these cylinders, tying it back here, um, and then some other mounts um, way up high, way down low, so we can get a couple more rods in there so that it's really rigid. But we just didn't have time to to implement that so I'd highly suggest make, really strengthening these arms up so that they can't walk like this. When we clamp down on a game piece um, they like to walk around um, and especially on the cone that's going to really drive how you pick it up. So you'll be down low up here and up high up here and this distance just doesn't work very well. Ideally you're perfectly parallel to each other and you can pick that cone up just like that. So with our green compliant wheels up here um, they're mounted on ball bearings that can freely spin. One thing to note on those, um, ball bearings really like uh, radial loads, you know, so up and down on the shaft, so we can support weight like this all day and they'll still spin freely. They don't like side loads, which is what we're applying here. So especially as soon as we come in with pneumatic pistons, you know, we're pulling a couple hundred pounds of force on those. Um, that's why, like in our reveal video, they don't like to pivot down um, if we don't pick the cone up all the way up. Um, one thing that, you know, one way to get around that, your, your ball bearings will come with lubrication inside. Um, that lubrication will add some resistance so you can soak them in WD-40 to get grease out um, and really loosen those up. Otherwise you can buy some differently designed bearings um, that support those side loads a lot better. Up next we're going to be going over our drivetrain here. Our drivetrain here is just a regular six wheel tank drive except for on the front, we actually swapped out the two kit of parts wheels for two Omni wheels. Those Omni wheels just allow us to turn a little bit easier and a little bit faster. We also removed the drop center, so that's again what those Omni wheels are helping with. Um, and then we just stuck with the basic kit of parts wheels on the back. Those are gonna help us keep that traction up that we're gonna need to get up and onto that ramp for the end game. So for programming, we're using Java, and uh, for controls, we're using two Xbox controllers, one for driving, and we're going to use the left stick for driving, right stick for turning, um, and then for our other driver, we'll, they will be using um, the left stick up and down for driving our arm up and down, uh, right stick for driving our extender in and out, and then the bumpers for opening and closing the claw. We're using a command-based robot. All of our code is on GitHub. This time we're going to be talking about the pneumatic system on an FRC competition robot. So starting off, everything is controlled by, well, first off the RoboRio. From there you're actually going to come back to your PCM. 
So the PCM on this robot, we actually have mounted on the back, so it's easily visible. So the PCM here is gonna control your solenoids, your compressor, and the pressure switch. Um, it's controlled via CAN bus. From here, we're actually gonna go with two sets of wires off to our compressor. So your compressor is gonna automatically turn on um, if it's done properly in your robot code. And it's gonna actuate or operate up until roughly 110 PSI, which is when the pressure switch on the compressor output will kick off the compressor via the PCM. So on the hardware side of things, you have a release valve. So you want that pretty much as close to the compressor as you can get it because you want it also easily accessible in case you have any failures or any uh, malfunctions in your system. You need to be able to bleed the air out of the system very quickly. And then you're also gonna run another hose that goes right into a gauge that will read your PSI for you that will be pumped into the tank. And then once the tank fills, it is gonna be able to then run into an actual working gauge that you will then set your working PSI for. And that'll usually run around 60 at max is what you want on an FRC robot. I think we're running probably about 30, 35, just so that we are not over pressuring the system and popping the cube. And then from there, it runs into the solenoid, which actually actuates and will run any of your systems. We only have one solenoid. You can have as many. This is actually a double acting solenoid, so it can go in both directions. It can open and close. And on these solenoids, you can manually activate them. So if you are just trying to test a system or you need to have a system open prior to um, actually competing, then you will, then you can activate the solenoid and be able to open the system if there's still air through it. And then from there, it will run into whatever channeling system to go to your actual pistons which will actually then be able to actuate. You just need to make sure that you are putting the valves um, and the hoses into the correct sides of the piston, having the actual intake side and the outlet side so that the um, piston will actually actuate correctly. All right, so we'll start electronics here at the Rio. This is gonna be the uh, brain of your robot. And then we got this ethernet cable go on to our REV uh, radio power module. This was new in, I believe, 2022. And uh, we've got some wires going to our PDH to the, um, it's going to the PDH. Uh, and then the other side is going to the radio. So just follow the instructions on your uh, radio power module. Uh, pretty hard to screw that up. Um, Another thing coming out of here, just plugging into one of the, these USB ports is a USB camera that we have mounted um, up under here. This is just to help alignment for picking up game objects. Also coming out of the Rio is our CAN bus. Um, and the CAN bus is gonna go through uh, all of our motor controllers, uh, through our pneumatics control module, and it uh, is gonna end in the PDH. So the CAN bus has to be connected to the PDH, um, otherwise robot inspectors will make you do that if you're using all sparks. Um, I've seen before a team use all sparks and not have a CAN bus at all. You're still going to have to run a CAN bus from your Rio to your PDH. Um, coming to our motor controllers, we have NEOs running all of our drivetrain. So we're using Spark Maxes for all of those, um, as well as for our... Um, Lifting arm, we're running a Neo, so this Spark Max is controlling that. Um, then we have a Talon SRX, and that is gonna be routed all the way up through here, coming all the way down here to our extender arm. This wire also coming out of our Robo Rio, it's gonna go to our RSL. Um, that needs to be on there and uh, visible. Coming down to the bottom left of our electronics panel is gonna be our uh, breaker, and this just goes directly to the battery and uh, back up directly into our PDH. So for our arm and grabber, um, the whole thing is uh, machine, or 
built out of a uh, extrusion of one by one inch, uh, eighth inch wall aluminum. This should be 16th inch wall, um, would make it a lot lighter. It's plenty strong enough for what you're doing. So if you are looking at getting aluminum, make sure to get 16th inch wall. That's just what we had on stock. Um, we have a section of two by one welded back here. Um, this is just to give us extra room to mount our, our hubs. Um, this whole arm is mounted on hex shaft that, so that we can drive it with a sprocket really easily. So that was just to get room for the hubs to mount. A piece of one by would take away pretty much all the meat that's on that one by one inch square tubing by drilling a hole for that hex shaft to clear. So we decided to weld that on the back. Um, if your team doesn't have access to welding um, or doesn't have the skill, um, you can easily slap plates along the side, do the same thing. Um, and bolt it together. Um, it would be just as strong. Um, Welding is just a little bit lighter, so we prefer to go that route. It's driven by a Neo. Uh, we use a Neo for the built-in encoder um, so that we can get position control on our arm and know what angle we're at. Um, that feeds into a 101 reduction um, through a Versa Planetary gearbox that has a 3D printed SIM adapter because um, we didn't have time to purchase one. Um, and then our chain drive, uh, we have a 12 tooth sprocket on the bottom and a 24 tooth up top. So our total gear reduction through here is 201. Um, this not only gives us more torque to just lift the arm, um, but it also makes it fall slower. So we, have, we get better control that way so that when we stop giving our motor power, our arm doesn't just drop right away. Um, we can hold it at an angle and just kind of make fine adjustments. Um, that's where like Brandon was talking about in our live Q&A with uh, PID controls. Um, we can monitor that angle and keep controlling to, to work our way back to there. So, so in our chain drive as well, you may notice that we have this extra sprocket just kind of hanging out here. Um, we do this to tension our chain. Um, it's kind of, you can throw this in a chain drive and it's going to sit right where it wants to. Um, I highly recommend not doing that. Um, it, it can fall out. It's in there pretty good um, and it's going to sit right where you need it. Um, however, over time, it'll, it can walk down and eventually we'll make contact with our other sprocket. Um, the best way to do this is to get an automatic or spring-loaded chain tensioner. Um, you can come around the back um, or around the front and push in. So in our case, we don't have too much clearance between our chain, so we'd want to push this chain out just to clearance that. Um, if you can um, and have enough space, it's almost always better to push your chain in so that you get more wrap angle on your sprocket. It's going to drive the, um, the chain a lot better. You're going to transmit your force a lot more cleanly. And spring-loaded tensioners, you can buy off the shelf. You're looking at maybe 50 to $60 for a spring-loaded ten tensioner. You throw a sprocket on it and you'll be fine. So um, I highly recommend going that route. So. so on the arm, we sized it out so that when we lift our arm up, um, we're at the right length to be holding a cone directly over uh, the second row peg. Um, if we want to do the first row, it's super easy. We lift it up a little bit, we drop it there. Um, but we lift it up all the way, we can hit, hit the second row, and then we have our extension arm. Um, the extension arm works uh, very simply. Um, we have 1775 Pro through a 50 to 1 gear reduction um, that drives these two, uh, or the, sorry, it drives this one uh, green compliant wheel. Um, and then we have another green compliant wheel that's just mounted on a bearing through a shaft. Um, on the other side of the uh, tubing. So when that wheel spins, um, these compliant wheels grip this one by one square inch alum or square tubing aluminum um, and extends our arm outwards. So, and then this extension is sized to get us to the third row um, and we go f all the way out on that um, before, and then we can just drop it and we're at the right length. So there's no like fine adjustment. We can't overshoot and we can't undershoot. All we have to do is go f all the way out with our arm. One of the big benefits of this design is as soon as we're all the way out and if we keep spinning our motor, our wheels just slip, right? So we have we can't overdrive this arm, we can't break this 3D printed part that way, um, and we're not gonna strip anything out. So uh, I would still recommend putting a limit switch here so that you don't just burn up this wheel, um, but we could sit here for quite a while and this, this wheel's not gonna burn out, so this wheel's not gonna be damaged. So on our arm, on our pivot too, um, we have this piece of one by one square inch aluminum, or square tubing aluminum across here. Um, this is to act as a hard stop so that we can't raise our arm too high. One, just so that we can't tip ourselves backwards, but two, if we didn't, we'd be able to swing this arm all the way behind us, but as we do that, we could go over our height limit, which is gonna give us a penalty during a match um, or potentially get us disabled. So we opt just to go for a hard stop so we can't physically do that. Um, and then we didn't have time to, to do this, but ideally we would mount a limit switch in here as well, um, because in this case, you are stopping this um, 
and this motor is gonna, if you try and keep driving this motor, um, you'll burn stuff up pretty quickly, break this chain, strip out sprockets, strip out gearboxes. Not a good time. So highly recommend mounting a limit switch. You can wire that directly into your motor controller. It doesn't take any more code, it'll stop it automatically. Um, and really takes all the, takes some pressure off the drivers of not being able to break your robot or not being able to, to break a rule on height limits.